So if 9-11 was really an inside job, then who were the people inside that did it? Well, we can start by looking at some of the people inside the buildings that were targeted and destroyed on 9-11. In the impact zone of the North Tower was a company called Marsh & McLennan, which at the time was the world's largest insurance brokerage company. One of Marsh's executives was a guy named L. Paul Bremer, who was also the chairman of the Congressional National Commission on Terrorism from 1999 to 2000, and the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Counterterrorism from 1986 to 1989. Instead of going to work on the day of 9-11 and dying inside the towers with hundreds of his employees, Bremer decided to go on MSNBC and tell the world that Osama bin Laden was behind the attacks and possibly Iraq and Iran. And then he demanded the most severe military response we can come up with. L. Paul Bremer was called away from Marsh in 2003 to become the Iraq occupation governor, a role he has been widely criticized for. So Bremer not only worked inside the buildings, but had offices directly in the impact zone of the North Tower where Flight 11 would hit. He missed work on 9-11 to give us the official story on national television, and went on to be the Iraq occupation governor. You really can't get more connected to 9-11 than that. Oh wait, you can, sorry. I forgot to mention that Bremer was also the former manager for Kissinger Associates. He was a member of the board for Axo Nobel, the parent of International Paint Company, which produced a fireproofing application for skyscrapers called Interchar. Bremer was also on the International Advisory Board for the Japanese mining and machinery company Komatsu, which at the time had been involved in a joint venture agreement with Dresser Industries, the oil services intelligence front where Prescott Bush Sr. and George H.W. Bush got their start with Neil Mallon. Anyway, the Komatsu Dresser Mining Division operated from 1988 to 1990 and in July 1996 it patented a nanothermite demolition device that could quote demolish a concrete structure at high efficiency while preventing a secondary problem due to noise flying chips and dust and the like as many of you know residues of thermite a highly energetic chemical mixture have been confirmed in samples of World Trade Center dust and the use of thermite at the World Trade Center was also revealed by environmental data see the description for more links and sources but wait a minute it would have taken tons of this stuff. How could they get it inside the buildings and put it into place without anyone finding out? This would have taken hundreds of people. Someone would have talked by now. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, who ran security for these buildings? Marvin Bush's company, Securecom Stratasec, did, up until 1998, when that role was handed off to Kroll Associates. Yet Stratasec still retained security contracts that didn't expire until the day of 9-11. Both these companies have a suspicious cast of characters working for them. Bush's cousin, Wirt Dexter Walker III, was the CEO of Stratasec with a long history as a manager for CIA front companies, such as Glor Forgan. The corporate operating officer of Stratasec was a guy named Barry McDaniel, who came from BDM International, where he was a vice president of material distribution and management systems. He also had a history of involvement with black projects. Securicom Stratasec also ran security at Dulles International Airport, where Flight 77 into the Pentagon was hijacked out of, and also had contracts with United Airlines. They also ran security at Los Alamos National Laboratories during the time period that nanothermite was first being developed there. Then there's Kroll Associates, also known as the CIA of Wall Street. Kroll's managing director was a guy named Jerome Hauer, who, like L. Paul Bremer, survived the 9-11 attacks by going on national television to give us the first accounts of the official story. Before anyone knew it was happening, these guys apparently had it all figured out. In addition to being managing director for Kroll, Jerome Hauer was the national security advisor with the National Institute of Health, which managed the government response to the anthrax attacks shortly after 9-11. On the day of 9-11, Howard advised the White House to start taking Cipro, an antibiotic effective against anthrax. And then strangely, a week later, two senators and several people in the media who had been calling for an investigation into the 9-11 attacks were mailed anthrax and told to shut up, apparently by members of Al-Qaeda, who later turned out to be a bioweapons researcher at U.S. Amrid in Fort Detrick, Maryland, named Stephen Hatfield, who had worked with Jerome Hauer for a company called SAIC. Scientific Applications International Corporation, a defense contractor with expertise in thermite-related technologies, played a large part in the NIST World Trade Center investigation. A few other names and companies inside the Twin Towers also worthy of further investigation include Craig Stapleton, who is married to Bush's cousin Dorothy Walker Bush. Stapleton was the president of Marsh Real Estate Advisors from 1982 to 2001. 
He was a member of the board of directors for Sendant that was charged with massive accounting fraud in 1998 and went on to join Winston Partners, a privately owned investment firm founded in 1993 and led by George W. Bush's brother Marvin. Other very powerful and well-connected people worked in senior management at Marsh. These included Stephen Friedman, a senior principal at Marsh Capital and, and former partner at Goldman Sachs, who later became George W. Bush's top economic advisor. Friedman was also a member of the Brookings Institution, the Bilderberg Group, the Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, and the board at InQtel, the investment firm founded by the CIA in 1998. InQtel invests in state-of-the-art technologies related to defense and intelligence work, including nano and chemical technologies, according to its website. In another interesting coincidence, Friedman belonged through Cornell University to a secret society called Quill and Dagger, the membership of which includes Paul Wolfowitz, Sandy Berger, and Stephen Hadley. Wolfowitz, the neocon deputy secretary of defense in the Bush administration, was the author in 1992 of the Wolfowitz Doctrine of Preemptive Warfare. He also made comments about a surprise like Pearl Harbor months before 9-11 and met with Pakistani ISI General Mahmoud Ahmed in the week before 9-11. Berger, the national security advisor to President Clinton, was later caught stealing documents from the 9-11 Commission investigation. Berger was also the boss of White House counterterrorism czar Richard Clark, and together with Hadley, who was Condoleezza Rice's deputy, was responsible for delaying or obstructing Clark's plans to stop al-Qaeda in January of 2001. Jeffrey Greenberg resigned from Marsh and McLennan after being accused of serious financial crimes. The first plane of 9-11 flew directly into his company's secure computer room in the North Tower. Jeffrey Greenberg is a member of the Brookings Institution and the Trilateral Commission. Jeffrey Greenberg rose quickly through management at Marsh, having come there directly from AIG in 1995, and then becoming CEO just four years later. At Brookings, Greenberg hobnobbed with Lee Hamilton, co-chair of the 9-11 Commission. There's also Jim Pierce, another Bush cousin, who was managing director of Aon Corporation, who, according to the NIST report, modified unknown sections of floor 83 in the South Tower in 1997. Jim Pierce had arranged a meeting on the 105th floor of the South Tower for that morning. Pierce survived that day, despite the fact that 12 people came to the meeting in the South Tower and 11 of them died. The location of the meeting had been changed the night before to the Millennium Hotel where Pierce watched the South Tower as it was hit by the aircraft. Apparently, the meeting attendees were not all notified of the change in location. Another interesting character is Joseph Kasputis of Baseline Financial Service, which occupied the impact zone of the South Tower on floors 77 and 78, where United Airlines 175 impacted. Kasputis has a history of being well-connected to the highest levels of government, as well as to the defense and intelligence industries. Kasputis worked from 1972 to 1977 for the U.S. Department of Commerce and Defense. He was also the deputy director of Nixon's White House task force that dealt with the Arab oil embargo of 1973 and was instrumental in the creation of the Department of Energy. Kasputis went on to run a large corporation called Primark that had offices in both towers on 9-11. One of the subsidiaries of Primark, the Analytical Sciences Corporation, TASC worked with so-called black or top-secret programs. TASC also worked closely with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Kasputis was also a member of the Logistics Management Institute, LMI, whose members included Paul Kaminsky of InQtel and General Dynamics, Charles D. Bona of Halliburton, Skull and Bones member Joseph Samuel Nye, and Michael Daniels of Scientific Applications International Corporation. LMI's self-proclaimed role is advancing the science of government. Kasputi's connections to the DOE from 1977 through at least 1997 are interesting considering that the DOE was developing thermite ignition devices as early as 1983. Joseph Kasputis went on to become the CEO of Baseline Financial Services, which was directly in the impact zone on the 78th floor of the South Tower. According to NIST, Kasputi's baseline financial modified the southeast corner of floor 78 in 1999, exactly where the aircraft hit on 9-11. Floors 77 and 78 were upgraded for fireproofing in June and April of 1998, respectively. Another company of interest on floor 91, just above the impact zone for the South Tower, was Washington Group International. This company was known primarily as a construction and mining firm, and it had just acquired Raytheon Engineers in July of 2000. 
In 1996, Washington took over Morrison Knudsen, an engineering and construction firm that had a history of working on large-scale projects around the world, including in China, Iran, Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia. The Army Corps of Engineers hired Morrison Knudsen to demolish over 200 buildings in 1995. One of the DOE facilities for which Washington was responsible well before 9-11 was the Savannah River site near Aiken, South Carolina. In February of 1997, Lawrence Livermore National Labs and the Savannah River site signed an agreement of cooperation to share technology. Savannah went on to add developing sol gel technology for fuels and other applications to its portfolio. Sol gel technology is utilized by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories for making nanothermites. In another coincidence, Savannah River Technology staff participated in the search and rescue operations at Ground Zero by providing unique tools. Just before 9-11, Washington was going through a tough time financially and sought Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Securities and Exchange Commission documents show that Washington made court-ordered pre-petition payments as part of these proceedings to a number of companies, including Komatsu. Washington also made payments to Greenhorn and Omara, whose employee, Teresa McAllister, was a lead author of the FEMA and NIST reports on the World Trade Center disaster, and to Sumitomo Bank, which was closely allied with Komatsu. Building 7 was a 47-story federal office building in the World Trade Center site, which collapsed at 5.20 p.m. on the afternoon of 9-11. This building was home to the CIA, in fact, the largest CIA headquarters outside of Langley, Virginia. It also housed offices for the Secret Service and the Securities and Exchange Commission. One of the most interesting tenants, however, was then Mayor Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management and its Emergency Command Center on the 23rd floor. This floor received $15 million worth of renovations, including independent and secure air and water supplies, and bullet and bomb resistant windows designed to withstand 200 mile per hour winds. Mayor Giuliani was a former U.S. prosecutor for the South District of New York from 1983 to 1989, who was in charge of investigating the terrorist financing Bank of Credit and Commerce International. After he left his job as a prosecutor to start a political career, he worked for a law firm called White and Case that actually represented BCCI. So he went from prosecuting the BCCI to working for a law firm which defended the BCCI. This was likely his foot in the door of this underground corporate criminal network. Giuliani would later help to destroy all the crime scene evidence from Ground Zero. Giuliani's sidekick on 9-11 was Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick, who appeared to be coaching some of Rudy's actions that day, keeping him away from the media and even answering questions for him about explosives in the buildings. In fact, Bernard Carrick gave us the first official government pronouncement that no explosives were involved in the destruction of the World Trade Center buildings. Carrick's department was also the same one that found that pristine, completely undamaged hijacker's passport, which survived a plane impact and fireball, which destroyed two titanium black boxes and three towers. Yeah, Carrick would later receive a nomination from President Bush to become Director of Homeland Security, which he declined for personal and political reasons, and instead took a job training the Iraqi police force in Iraq alongside L. Paul Bremer. Both men are credited for turning Iraq into the unwinnable quagmire it is today. In February of 2010, Carrick was sentenced to four years in federal prison for conspiracy and fraud charges, unrelated to the crimes of 9-11, unfortunately, but it still goes to show you what kind of person he is. Definitely the kind of person you'd want inside the New York City police force during a staged event like 9-11. And lastly, we have the Pentagon. It's certainly peculiar, to say the least, that Al-Qaeda terrorists hell-bent on destroying the USA would not crash their plane into the north wing of the Pentagon, where all the most important offices were, like Donald Rumsfeld, John Ashcroft, etc., and that they would instead choose to target the one section of the Pentagon that had most recently been refurbished to withstand missile impacts. It's also interesting to note that the company which completed the $258 million refurbishment to Wedge 1 of the Pentagon was also hired as a contractor to clean up Ground Zero in New York City. Wedge 1 also coincidentally housed the Pentagon's Budget Analyst Office, where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that was reported missing by Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld in a press conference the day before 9-11. The Pentagon's comptroller in charge of that money at the time was an interesting fellow named Dov Zakheim, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and a contributor to the neocon think tank project for the new American century. Zakheim helped write the PNAC document Rebuilding America's Defenses, in which he is credited for the line which states, 
Further, the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. Several members of the Bush administration, including President Bush himself, would later refer to 9-11 as a new Pearl Harbor. If anything, the individuals and organizations outlined in this video are at least as suspicious as the 19 hijackers themselves.